Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12 from the New King James Version this morning still, I think. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. Heard your what? Heard your prayer. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will turn and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you did in the first service and for what you're going to do right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm mindful that when I preach, that I'm preaching not only to you, but also to a, quite a large group of people that are connected to our podcast. And not only that, but also online. And uh, things that go over the internet are instant, they're global, and they're forever. So let, let's all just remember that. When it goes on the internet, it's instant, global, and forever. Some of those pictures that you might have taken... You certainly wouldn't want to see those later on, maybe. So maybe you shouldn't take them. Amen. And I'm mindful that I'm not only preaching to you, I'm preaching to those that are online through the modern media of, uh, and, and uh, streaming web and all of that. But I'm preaching also in the heavenlies. How many of you know that with the church, manifold wisdom of God is made known even to the powers and principalities because of what we do, the way that we declare the gospel and proclaim that. Not only that, I believe this morning I have a word for America. So when I preach to you, I'm not just preaching to you and all the people online. I'm going to preach to America. And I just believe that I'm a, I've got, for a moment, by faith, this morning, I believe that I've got the ear of the nation and I'm going to bring it like that. Is that okay? This text that we find has been a text that has been chosen by intercessors decades and decades ago as, an, as, a, as a scripture for America. But it's not just a scripture for America. It's a scripture for any nation that's in trouble. To understand the context of Second Chronicles, and we're going to look at a number of different uh, scripture sections today. But to understand the context, Solomon has dedicated the first temple. In fact, look at verse 1 with me, please. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord, the what? The glory of the Lord filled the temple. Many people want His power. Many people want the power of God to flow through their life. They want the fire. They want the glory. Zero prayer life. And if you have a zero prayer life, you'll have zero fire. After he finished praying. Verse 2. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord that had filled the Lord's house. So God's presence, God's power, God's glory, so big, so strong. There's nobody that can actually go into the church. If I could just make a today's application. People are just outside because you can't go in. It's too, too big, too vast, too heavy. Glory is, is the Hebrew word kabod. It's, it means heavy. Remember in some of you in the 60s. That's heavy, man. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what that is. It's the weighty presence of the Shekinah glory of God. If you're from the south, Shekinah That's how you say that. In, some, in Tennessee, I think, in Kentucky, Kentucky, Shekinah. And so they prayed, and the Shekinah God fills the temple so much that the pastors can't even come to minister. Ain't nobody's coming in, and everybody's crying. If you look at, they worshiped, and they say, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. And so it's this amazing moment, and after that, and there's more to it, and they, 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 you know, Solomon brings 20, how many thousand? 22,000 bulls. That's a lot of bull. 22,000 bulls he brings in and has sacrifices, and it's 122,000 sheep. Wow, you can't even fill 122,000 sheep in this building. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of sacrificing. That's an extravagant offering. And it's amazing to me that some people think that, that God doesn't receive offerings today. He does. It's all part of worship. 
And so the Lord appears to him now a second time, and that's the text that we read. So God appears to Solomon right after that and says, yo, Saul, probably didn't say that, but <laughs> says, I've chosen this place, verse 12, when I shut up the heavens and there's no rain or command locusts to devour the field or send pestilence among my people. Notice it's when I send it. He's talking about judgment. All right, J just remember all of this now. He's talking about judgment. When judgment comes on the nation, if my people, if it's an if-then clause, if and then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Now, we're fasting. Do you know fasting is, is, a, is a way of humbling yourself? You're saying, Lord, I want you more than food. I want you more than Xbox 360. I want you more than, I want you more than all that. And, and you, you're humbling yourself before the Lord saying, I need your help. And a broken and contrite heart he will not spurn. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and pray. Oh, there it is. Uh, okay, there it is. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Everybody say, seek my face. And turn, and what? And turn from their wicked ways. He's talking to his own people. He's talking to believers in application today. He's saying, hey, I can cause a big turnaround when things have gone bad. If you who are called by his name, is anybody called by his name in here? That's us. You humble yourselves, pray, seek his face. Turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. America is in some serious trouble. We are in serious trouble. Now, many of you don't see it that way because it's like, how do you boil a frog? You know, he keeps jumping out of the pot. Well, you just bring the temperature up real slow before you know it, he goes to sleep. And there are many that have gone asleep in our nation. The church is asleep in many places. Deader than a doornail, twice pulled up from the roots, wandered out of the way of understanding, and they have the congregation of the dead. Well, God is waking up people. There is a shaking that's coming. There is a shaking that's coming to our nation. Just because you're up in Alaska, glory to God, I love this land. God called me here. Did he call you here? If not, you should repent and get back to where you belong. But he, he called us here. And God's got a redemptive plan for this great state. And it's not just this state. He's got a redemptive plan for the entire United States of America. Now, you don't see the United States in the end time eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end things. You don't see the United States in there that, that the, theologians can tell, that I can tell, I can't, I, I don't see it. But that doesn't mean I'm going to just cow down and, and quit, and turn yellow belly and run. America has faced challenges in the past. America has faced philosophical challenges of Nazism. Some of you remember that, perhaps, or heard of it at least. Most of that generation has passed. We've faced communism. We've faced ideologies that have, have really endangered our country before. We've faced theological challenges in the past, like universalism. That was a gangrenous teaching that spread in the United States, and it almost really destroyed the church, some say. We're facing that even now. We're facing, theologically, we're facing... Gangrenous teaching again, which I would call neo-Calvinism. And it's, it's a horrible thing, and I've got a series online. You can go listen to it about grace, amazing grace, what real grace is. There's a lot of deception. And we've got an election cycle coming up. It's, it's just around the corner. You say, well, that's not for... No, it's around the corner. And every election cycle is important because it allows for us, the people, we the people, we, the people, are allowed to change the course of our government. And I will tell you, I am aghast at the, abo at the abominations and the things that are taking place, yet so many are asleep. And if, if you're like me at times, I just feel hopeless. I'm like, somebody impeach him for God's sake. Yank him out. 
I mean, how is it? I'm just saying, how is it? You know, and it's been Republicans and Democrats and so on and so on. How does a Bill Clinton have sexual acts in the Oval Office and still say president? I can't understand that for the life of me. How is it with all the corruption? And so your opportunity is in this next election cycle to do something. I'm going to tell you it's been, it's been declared that if the church, if Christians would respond and vote biblically, it's not about black. It's not about white. It's not about a man. It's not about a woman. It's about what's right and what's wrong. It's about biblical truth. And if you vote any other way, you're the racist. And if you're a racist, you're not going to have revival. You'll have no part of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Quiet. I'll do the preaching, thank you. God is doing an amazing thing in the body of Christ. He really is. And we're in trouble, but this election cycle is very important. So who are you voting for? I don't know. I'm not done praying yet. We're in trouble. Well, Let's go a little deeper. Leviticus chapter 18, turn there. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Well, I got the joy. What can I tell you? This is the moment for the church to rise. I would say to every challenge in our country and history and even nations, there's always an opportunity for God to intervene and, and what God did to Solomon that we can apply to our lives, to our nation today. Nations are made of families, people. Is we can turn things around. It's like, if you, let's say you had a problem physically and you pray and you come to the altar and you look for healing and, and maybe it's a little stubborn. And so you go to the doctor. Right? See, if you don't believe that healing's for today, let me just ask you, why'd you go to the doctor? So you're just going to want to disobey God or, I mean, you, right? So healing is for today, and we believe that, and that's why it's good to go to a doctor too. Somebody say amen. And so if you need some help, you're going to go to the doctor, and they write you a prescription. This is a prescription for when a nation is under judgment. This is what we saw, 2 Corinthians 7. Okay, here we go. You ready? Leviticus. Chapter 18. Verse 20, brace yourself. Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Now, after every one of these verses, just say amen, all right? You shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. Amen. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fires of Molech nor you shall nor profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Amen. Verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Amen. You shall not mate with any animal to defile yourself with it. Nor any woman shall stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. Amen. Verse 24. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things. Listen very closely now. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things, for it's by these things that the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. So get the picture. Moses is, is, is getting the word from the Lord, and he's heading into the promised land. And God says, yo, Moses, here's the deal. They are being evicted from the promised land because of an illicit. In fact, Leviticus 18 is all kinds of sexuality things. In fact, there's two things in there. Sexuality and perversion. Men with men, women with men, animals, on and on and on and on. And then it talks about none of your descendants shall pass through the fires of Molech. Do you know what that is? Molech, Molech is, a, is a demon god and they would take their 
newborn children and offer it to these demon gods. So it's, it's sexual perversion and killing babies. That's what it is. And he says, I am evicting all of the, of the, of the, of the people of Canaan's land because of this. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down, sexual perversion, on and on and on and on. And the fires of Molech killing your babies. And as a result of that, their sin has reached its fullness. There is a place of fullness that comes, as we can study that at another time, a place of fullness that comes, and as a result, at that moment, then God says, that's it, I'm going to evict them now, and God pulls out, kicks out Canaan's land because of their sin. Now, let's look here a little more. Verse 28, lest the land vomit you out. It's not polite to talk about vomit in church, but I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen to America unless we have a major revival. What's going to happen is the land will vomit us out. It's already started. The gagging has already started. It really has. So, given that, let's look at this text. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, the context is the dedication of the temple. The Lord appears to Solomon. I've shared that with you already. He gives a remedy for a nation under judgment. How does that apply to us, Pastor? Well, the key verse is, is if my people who, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now I want you to go and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's talk about what wicked ways are. See, because here's the thing. Here's what's happened to the church and in America. The church is defiled. Now, I, this, is not a, this is a repeat of many things I've said here before. The church is defiled. What do you mean? You see, the church is supposed to be a victorious church walking in the power and the authority of heaven. The church is supposed to move in healing signs and wonders. That, that, come on, let us, we're like an outpost of heaven is what we are. That's what we're supposed to be. But many people don't have power, don't have zeal, don't have passion, don't have joy because they live kind of one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the, in, in the, in the, in the world or in the devil's kingdom. And so they dabble with sin, with pornography, with adultery. They dabble with sexual sin and, and these things and bring this wickedness on themselves and cause them to basically walk. Well, it's like, it's like Jesus said, you, know, you can nullify the word of God through your traditions. Listen, you can shut down the anointing in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in your life. Anointing, the God enablement, the God power, the God's power to get the stuff done. And the church has been mostly shut up and silenced and, and marginalized because most people are defiled. Most people are filling their minds with pornography. Most people are smoking pot, smoking dope, smoking stuff, and thinking it's all good. And, oh, well, they made it a law. That's because we've moved from sociolog we've moved from the, the foundation stone of Western civilization being the Bible, the Judeo-Christian roots as the Ten Commandments. We've moved from laws being based on God's Word to having what is now called sociological law, which basically means this. This basically means what I think is right is I mean come on if it's reasonable to me that and what you're going to see that's why you have a homosexual agenda just because listen if you're a man every cell I could scrape a little cell off of Pastor Alex we could get scrape it and put it on check out the DNA you know what it's going to say it's going to say you're a man he knows it great man of God there's no doubt we could, we could come to Pastor Cal, Karen and, and take, a, take a, a sample and get down to look at her DNA and every bit of her DNA cries out that she's a woman and you are a woman. <laughs> because God created the male and, and female. And so that is the way it is. And so no matter what somebody says, you can feel like a woman all you want. You need healing and deliverance. You can feel like a man. If you're a woman, you need healing. I know I'm preaching to the choir, really ticking somebody off. but So we've moved to sociological law, and now we have, a, now we have people that just think it's okay to do basically whatever they want to. Do you remember Judas? 
Judas, when he sat down with Jesus to take communion, it's interesting that the devil enters him after he eats the bread. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about those who eat the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. It's a picture of defilement. In fact, as we look at 1 Corinthians 6, let me set it up. The Corinthian church is filled with pride, not unlike the church in America. Some of the nonsense that happens at church in America never happen in a place where it's just totally broken and you need God's miracles or you're dead. That's why revival's breaking out in Africa and all these places. America's got so much. I mean, we just get upset when our batteries run out of our remote control. <laughs> our easy chair doesn't work, and so we're all, you know, bent out. It's the devil. It's the devil. A remote doesn't work. My easy chair broke. Bind you right now. Most of the world's scampering around to get another meal. Most of the world's scampering around believing God to eat for their next meal. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul confronts the church in Corinth through his epistle. And we understand what's happening in Corinth. Come on, turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We understand what's happening in the epistles, in the letters, epistles, Greek for letter. We understand because we, if he's getting, if, if somebody says, um, hey, you just hear one side of the conversation, you can't see the other person. They say, hey, take your hands out of the pockets. It's your pockets. It's safe to say that the guy who you can't see has his hands in his. Right. Would you please take your hands out of your pockets? You can't see the other guy. You don't know what's going on. It's a phone conversation. Well, that doesn't really make sense, but you get the idea. Take your hands out of your pockets so we can safe to say that whoever that is has their hands in their pockets. So what the Apostle Paul, he's writing, come on, let's read this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, fasten your seatbelt high and tight, put your trays in the upright lock position, brace yourself, okay? Hold on. Verse 9, 1 do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be deceived? Everybody say, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa! So that means if you're practicing any of those things, you could have named the name of Jesus, but if you're practicing, you have a lifestyle of it, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And so... He says, don't you know that if you live like this, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you know that if you're, if you're a drunkard, you're in adultery, you're, you're fornicating, you know, your idolatry, slander, he, he lists sexual sins, then he moves on to some other sins. And he's saying, hey, stop it. Hello, take your hands out of your pockets. In other words, don't you know that if you do that, you're not going to inherit the kingdom? Don't you know that you actually forfeit I mean, it's once saved, always saved, right? Does some people believe that? I don't believe that. Because I see too much evidence. I'm more Armenian and Armenian lean to the Armenianism than Calvinism. I don't think you can receive Jesus in a real way and continue in your sin. The Bible talks about that. The Bible talks about in the book of Hebrews, continue, you know, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that nobody, see that nobody turns from the Lord and has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Turning from the Lord, the word there is really the same as turning to Him. That means you can turn away from Him. So He's rebuking the church saying, stop! Stop it! Stop, stop, stop it with all the pornography. Stop it with all the sexual sin. Knock it off. And he really is, He's really referring to Leviticus 18. That's what He's talking about. Look at your neighbor and say, well, I'm so glad I came to church. Go ahead, tell him. Praise God, good to be in the church today. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, let us not leave out. Verse 11. Because we've wiped out the church right there. We just listed all of it. You say, well, that's everybody. Yep. But look at verse 11. And such were some of you. So maybe some of you weren't that. In other words, he's saying such were some of you. That's not everybody then. It's 
Such for some of you. Come on, let's be biblical. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So he's saying, hey, do you not know you can't continue to do the things that you're doing? Don't you remember that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified by the name of the Lord Jesus? He lists, really, what is wicked ways. Wow. So the Corinthian church has many problems. Back to your notes. Their biggest problem is deception. And I think that's the biggest problem for the church these days. They think it can do whatever they want to and it'll be all right. No, that's not true. I don't care what the neo-Calvinist might teach you. False and wrong. The Apostle Paul makes it clear the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is much like our culture today. And the, and the Apostle Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. The Apostle Paul ma makes this list of evil behavior after that. It makes it clear that we defile ourselves by, by what we do. He lists sexual sin. Uh, this is interesting. There's two Greek words for homosexuality. One is passive and one is active. And I, I'm really not sure all that that means. Although uh, I, have seen, I have seen people, uh, well, let me just say this. It's all acts of homosexuality, all of it. I'm surveying for the ages in the church. Children's churches upstairs. Come on, smile at me. Go ahead and smile. <laughs> you say, I can't help myself. I can't help. Yes, you can help yourself. Yes. He said, no, I can't. No, let, me, let, me, let me help you. If you're in a car and you're parked by a lake watching the submarine races, all in the 50s, understand what that I'm talking about. You, were, you went through the 50s, you know, just flat out what I'm saying. You can't watch submarine races. Can you, Mom? No. Because they're underwater, which means you're doing something else. Okay. So you're in the car, and you're steaming up the windows. And your you're, 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 you're boyfriend and girlfriend, let's say, right? And all of a sudden, there's a rap on the window. You wipe off the fog, and it's the girl's father with a shotgun. How many of you fathers have a shotgun? I have numerous ones. I have lots of guns. Thank you, Jesus. Raps on the window, roll down the window. And he's cocked, locked, and ready to rock. And he says, get out of the car. Young man gets out of the car and says, if you ever touch my daughter again, it's over. Got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Guess what? You don't have a problem anymore. You see, something bigger than your urge and your selfishness has overtaken you. A bigger revelation called a shotgun and an angry, possessive father who has no problem shooting you. In a place that's un, unspeakable. That would be the judgment for you not to take your hands off of the girl. So the guy, how many of you know that the, the young man, whoever it is, he's healed. You see, many people don't have a problem doing the things that defile them and actually cause them to end up forfeiting heaven because they don't really understand hell. They don't really understand that. They think that God, that nothing's really happened yet, so it's all good in the hood. They think it's okay now because God didn't do anything yet. No, 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 no. You take his kindness for weakness. A little bit of hell fire this morning. You're not amening nearly enough. Come on, just lift your hands and say hallelujah. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Because America has to hear this. America has to hear this message. A church has to hear it. They're a defiled church like Judas who had in his mind he's going to betray the Lord. And he took communion, 1 Corinthians 11. If you, if you don't receive it in a worthy manner, it's like you're crucifying the Lord all over again. And the Satan entered Judas, the text says there in the Gospels, and he went out and did his thing. 
Some believers are so defiled, it's like the devil's riding their back or one of his minions. And, and, and the apostle Paul here, he, he talks about uh, a, a man in, I believe it's chapter 5, he says, it's reported among you that there's a man who's having sex with his father's wife. Kick him out of the church. Do you not know that a little leaven goes through the whole lump? You know what, anybody, any bread makers out there? Doesn't take much yeast, does it? Not much. And some of you, some of you have yeast in your life. Some of you... Some of you have people in your life that you just need to distance yourself from. I'm not talking about cutting them off. How will they know unless we model and share and love them? Yes, but some of you have them up close and personal. You say, well, it's my husband. Well, you just pray. <laughs> Amen. You pray and minister to him. Come on, as long as he's willing to be with you, then you have to stay married. That's your mission field. You fast, you pray. God can turn the heart of, of, a, of a stubborn husband. Yes, he can. It's my wife. Well, there was a man in church. Uh, the whole church is full. In fact, Satan showed up. Place freaked. Everybody ran out. I mean, every and every exit was just a flood of people running away. Ah, oh, it's the devil! And there's just one guy left. About six or seven rows back. And the devil said, "Aren't you scared of me?" He says, "Oh heck no! I'm married to your sister." All right, I just, it's not really biblical. It's not biblical. It's just, can you just enjoy that as an isolated whole? All right? Jesus, help us. If you're offended, just keep in mind I haven't eaten for seven days. I'm really not sure where I am, and everything is kind of foggy. It's just kind of... Lord, forgive me. If that grieved you. All right, where are we? Okay, he lists other acts, B, thieves, greedy, drunkards. But he gives great hope. And this is the hope of America. The gospel, the church, is the hope of America. America can be healed. America can be healed. America is made of families. You know, we think of America, all oh, the land, home of the free, the land of the brave, you know. Is that, is that right? Home of something like that. Jesus, help me. I need a juice. Jesus, help me. From sea to shining sea, we think. I'm just kidding. I'm good. And, you know, there's this massive body of land and federal government and all the states. But America's made of families. You see, the key is that families should get set on fire. You see, we want to change our nation, and we need to. And some of you need to get involved in the political process so thankful for you, Nolan Edna, and for others that are involved. Because you can change things. But we've got to have revival in our homes. Sir, sir, not ma'am, sir, father, the fathers. Listen, buddy, you're responsible. You try to point the finger at somebody, but it's really you that's got to get on fire. And your wife will turn. Man is the head of the household. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't mean the woman's less. It, we're in big trouble. I'm in big trouble without my wife. In fact, I told her she had other obligations here in the second service for the ministry. And I said, you have to cancel them. Because I need your beautiful face on the front row so I don't get too crazy. Because she helps me. She helps me. She tempers me. So I start getting a little, you know, she goes, da, 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 da. Easy. Don't drive angry. Don't drive angry. Don't drive angry. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I don't know if I can finish. God, help me. There's great, God gives us great hope. That's what some of you were. You can be changed. Come on, you can be changed. Come on, God. God has changed my life. And he's still changing me. These things are long gone. He's doing fine-tuning or something. He's working on me. Putting his finger on attitudes. He's dealing with me, and he's dealing with you, if you'd be honest with yourself. He's dealing with you. He's, he's showing you lovingly, trying to say, stop that. Don't do that. There's a better way. And there is a reward for serving God. There has to be a paradigm shift. 
if the youth could get a hold of, if you could get young adults, every age group, every ethnic group, if they could get a hold of the peace and the joy, the authority and the power and the enablement that comes from God and God alone. And that at his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. That there is no crack, no sex, no drug. There's nothing, no cheap, sub. they're all cheap substitutes from the devil. If you could get a taste and see that he is good, you will never, ever, like a dog, go back to the vomit. You won't go back to the pile of wickedness. You won't go back there because you have something better. It's called the Lord. Peace and joy and hope. And so there's hope that you can be changed. All right, how do these passages help us today to face these elections? Well, there's elections coming up. I want to tell you right now, if you've never voted before, register and get ready to vote. When I was 18, I didn't vote. I was able to vote. It wasn't able. I just didn't, I didn't get it. And I got saved, and I sat under instruction and teaching, not unlike this. All of a sudden, I realized, oh, man, I have a responsibility before heaven actually to do something. I won't tell listen here, this is my opinion. Everybody say this is pastor's opinion. If you don't vote, I believe it's sin and you should leave the country and go do something else. And like I said, it's not about red and yellow, black and white. It's about the issues. That's what it's about. So if you're not registered, take care of it. We put forms out. We'll do that. Can we get them early? I mean, I, this is just like, if the ch- you know, it's reported that if the church turned out and voted according to the issues or whatever, then, then we'd really have a turnaround in our country. But it has to continue. That's just the beginning. That The government is so that we can live at peace with one another. Then we have to bring revival. Then we have to get everybody saved. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, God help me finish this message. Pastor Alex, would you come please? Number one sin, I believe, in America is sexual sin. We've moved away from God's plan for sex. God's plan for sex is for pleasure, children, and oneness. Those are the three reasons God created it. God created it and it's been manipulated. It's turned into recreation and manipulated by people. The free love movement really, 1960s, wasn't love and it wasn't free. Broke in, defiled our country. Now you've got 13-year-olds having babies and they can't wipe their own noses. There's advocacy groups that now argue that, you know, the, the, the rights that people have to stay can have sex any way that they choose. Should not be. The tragedy of sex outside of the marriage covenant brings judgment, basically brings trouble, it brings a curse. You see, you're so significant made in God's image that you should never be like that with somebody until it's forever under the covenant until death do us part. And in actual fact, in actual fact, if I could get just a little bit graphic, it's a blood covenant. How many of you know you're saved by the blood? Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes, it washes my In Jewish culture, what they do is after the marriage is consummated, they, this is true. They take the sheets from the bed, the marriage bed, and they take them outside and they hang them outside the house so that all who drive by and see the blood on the sheet go, yeah, it's a real marriage. Now, wasn't that way for for many. God's able to restore that. God's able to restore virginity. I'm on somebody's nerve helping you out right now. It is a covenant act. It's a blood covenant. And it's so special, so significant. It should never, ever happen unless it's the context of till death do us part. And then you can have as much fun, as many children as you want to. I'm just saying. Don't look at me like that. You guys look at me like all religious tone of voice. Like. <laughs> it's not fun. That's my civic duty. You need healing, dude. You need healing. Ma'am, you need healing. 
We have marriage counseling. You can sign up for that. I'm joking, and I'm not joking. Because many were taught that it's, that it's wrong, it's impure, it's dirty. <laughs> I don't see that in here. That's somebody who's just filled with shame. God created, it's God's idea. But outside of marriage, yeah, shameful, dirty, brings a curse. Yep. Smile at me. Come on, help me out. I'm trying to close. I'm trying to, see. come on, smile. Come on, you can fake it. Somebody like, fake a smile, do something. Oh, the tragedy of our nation is continuing along this path, and this is important, and I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Here, let's pray for me real quick. Reach your hands towards me. Help me, God. <laughs> Help me land the plane and say what you want to say. Help me focus right now. In Jesus' name, amen. The tragedy of this is when you make sexual laws, when you make laws, sexual laws based upon not biblical truth and reality, but sociological law, is then those who stand on what's true based upon God's word become then breaking the law. And that, that's trouble then when they come in and say, you can't preach that homosexuality is wrong. Handcuff me now because I can't stop. It's far be it for me to obey them rather than God. I'll stand before God, so will you. And so listen, when you get to that, then you get to a hate crime. Then you get to hate crime, see? Then, then you begin to say, hey, no, you can't do that because that's a hate crime. And if you do that, then we're going to lock you down. We're going to take your building. We're going to take your stuff. And then we're going to close you. There's no more church because you're a bunch of haters. All we're doing is standing on God's word. And by the way, we don't hate. We don't hate anybody caught in that bondage. We love you. There's help. There's therapy and deliverance for you. Some of you have been set free from bondage like that. Call her glory to God. Come on, somebody say glory to God. Yet in California, reparative therapy is outlawed. Reparative therapy is, is counseling to help those bound in homosexuality. And it's outlawed. You can't do it. It's against the law. And in Norway, they're starting to have seven and eight-year-olds. You know, when they're seven or eight, they tell them about the different sexes you can be. There's videos. Yeah, you can go watch it. Just in case you don't think I'm telling the truth, because I am. It's called Trans Norway. Go Google it. It's a video. And they show it in Norway to kids of seven or eight years old and say, if you want to be a girl, you can be a girl. If you want to be a guy, you can be a guy. And if you want to be in between and whatever, you can be in between. And so then when they get 12 or 13 or whatever, then, you know, they're, they're saying basically, so, you know, which are you choosing? Because, you know, this is a viable choice to be a homosexual or, or a transsexual or any of these. And I'll tell you what else is going to come down the line. Children. People are declaring there are those who are so twisted and so defiled and so bound that pedophilia is becoming a, uh, a, a right, like that's a, ch it's a choice. Is, is anybody here? Now, I know you came for just a little John 3.16, but I ain't serving that up today. John 3, 16 is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. But for the love of God, somebody has got to stand up and say these things. Otherwise, our nation will go straight. And, and I'll tell you what happened. If, if this isn't preached and declared, if another black robe regiment isn't raised up, do you understand what I'm saying? If they're not raised up, then the land will vomit us out and we'll be totally destroyed. Every nation that's lost their people, that's lost our guns, is genocide. I got guys that you have to come and take mine. That's right. I'm with them. You're going to have to come and take mine. 